Hi everyone, and uh, thanks so much for joining us on our Friday live stream. I'm Sammy, and I'm joined by my co-host Corey. I'm excited to share this project and have this conversation about design and design theory and designing, thinking about CAD with CAM in mind. Um, so let us know where you're tuning in from, and uh, yeah, so we're excited to hear hear uh, about what you're working on. If you're working on any holiday projects, let us know. I, I'd love to hear about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. And I really like uh, this project and more importantly, I really like what we're going to discuss here, which is kind of some of the techniques or workflows we use to go, you know, from idea to CAD and then to the toolpath creation and, and through that. And so this project is ready to be cut. So I really like this, this topic. Awesome. Yeah. And so this is, uh, I'm, would like for us to use this project as a way to talk about how you might approach uh, any any type of project, whether it's for fun or if it's a product for uh, prototyping or for production. Uh, we want to always reach for the right tool for the right job. And sometimes that's not a physical tool, sometimes it's software. Uh, and if you have a particular program that you're really comfortable with, a lot of times, for example, VCarve or Aspire uh, can accomplish the same thing you can accomplish in Fusion. Just the way we approach the design to manufacturing process will be a little bit different, or at least how mm -hmm. we might create the initial design, uh, mm -hmm. depending on how your particular brain works in terms of design. I always you know, lay in bed at night trying to fall asleep and it's just uh, going and thinking about all the different ways I could model a particular project or uh, achieve a certain cam setup and then uh yeah so it really depends on how you like to approach so in the chat will you guys let us know what your favorite cad cam programs are uh, let me know if you're using more vcarve aspire or if you all are using fusion and i've modeled this project in both fusion vcarve and aspire so i'd like to walk us through all three different programs and the benefits uh, and approaches you might use for each one um, so let us know which ones you're using the most and we'll start with that one initially yeah. and if you're a hands-on person you know maybe your first step is cardboard or paper and scissors and you're kind of drawing stuff and getting some uh, uh rough dimensions but one of the really powerful things about digital fabrication is we can kind of prototype in the digital space. And I'm really excited to see how you kind of use those different programs to prototype the, these parts, Amy. Awesome. So let's go ahead and I'll share my screen and we can talk about um, screen share. Here's Corey. I have to. I'm big. You're big. You okay, I'm going to be small over here. So. There we go. I might move our videos around uh, because each program has the um, uh, browsers and, and pop-up windows yeah. in different spots. So uh, if you saw in the thumbnail, uh, we're making these, I'm calling them nesting honeycomb serving platters and dinnerware. So uh, the concept to me was I wanted to make a holiday adjacent project, but also something I could kind of use year round uh, to me Holidays are about gathering. Um, of course, we're having smaller gatherings, but I still, uh, you know, food is definitely something that um, is something very special, no matter what holiday you celebrate. Uh, so dinnerware was kind of something I, I have been wanting to make, or at least think about coming up with a solution that would work well for me. I also have a personal goal of making uh, many of the things that uh, I interact with in my own home. Let me see if I can and bring up some examples here of a larger design where I made a, um, a variety of versions of a plate that could stack, that could uh, be adaptable, whether it was from a template or a parametric model, in order to accomplish uh, different things that you would like a platter to serve on, on your dinner table, whether it was a plate you eat off of or a bowl for dinner rolls or, you know, having little dividers for chips and dip and that kind of thing. 
One of the other parameters I gave myself for this particular design is to use up my uh, shame scrap pile that I have. And I, uh, here, I'll switch back over here so I can show you some examples. Uh, I have, I know we all, let me know if you guys have piles of just like end grade, like, uh, you know, hardwood cutoffs. I probably have 20 of these at least stacked in every corner of my studio. So um, I wanted to use these up and oh, here's a thicker one. So the really interesting thing is that this propose, this gives me some really interesting ways that I need to approach the machining and the setup for the files because I'm trying to use up mm -hmm. all the scrap. All of them are really unique. I want to use them all to their fullest ability. This one happens to be particularly uh, thick. So maybe that would work better for a deeper bowl. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be able to use each piece of scrap to its fullest potential because none of us love like to waste uh, material. And we want to bring out the specific characteristics of each piece. So yeah, and, and that's the inner woodworker in us not wanting to, you know, waste beautiful material yeah. and really bring it to its fullest potential. So I think, uh, yeah, we all have that pile uh, in the wood shop somewhere. Sometimes it's a small pile, sometimes it's bigger, but I really like this approach for, for making it smaller if you need more space. Right, exactly. I, I figure that mo many uh, other folks have this uh as problem as well so we might as well use it up and um, make a project out of it so yeah. let's see i'll go back to our screen share here and so well this is just a great model sammy i really like that you kind of show this not only as individual parts but as you know a whole working unit thank you i really appreciate it this was a ton of fun to think through in regards to um how to create parts that fit together, that uh, work together. It's kind of a system. Um, as we always talk about, fusion is very, has a strength in assemblies. So parts, seeing how they fit together. My other favorite mm -hmm. aspect is the parametric aspect of the modeling. So I'm gonna bring us back to, this is my base model I started with. And we can just, you can see over here, I only have two sketches. So if I open this first one, it's just a mm -hmm. hexagon with an offset mm -hmm. for this edge lip and the little offset here for the tolerance. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Finish this sketch. And then I made a, another sketch here on the top of that model after I had extruded it for the, the bowl recess. So when I look at this in perspective here, you can see if I, I zoom in that we have a little foot on the bottom. So that will kind of lock in if we have them stacked, which will be really great for storage. And I'll open up our parameters here in Fusion. So here is something that I really like to start with when I'm doing modeling in Fusion. I set up a bunch of parameters and I continue to add to this as I go um, and try to foresee all the dimensions that I will need and then I can adapt them as I have my particular use cases. So for example, my plate diameter is 10 inches, but if I, if I change this parameter to 15 inches, it'll adapt my entire model to, to accommodate that change. So I think this is even more powerful when I'm having, or I can particularly leverage the parameters in this case for the different thicknesses mm -hmm. of material. So here I've mm -hmm. already set a short thickness, medium, medium, uh, thick, and uh, a deep thickness. So just trying to foresee the variety of materials that I would have. I have a little bit of a tolerance. So as I mentioned before, the inset of the the foot on the bottom of the plate is inset just a set amount so that I know I have a little wiggle room when they're stacked up together mm -hmm. and a couple different round over options as well. So if I click, okay, I can see this is, uh, those are the very basic parameters. And I did this si very similar thing in V carve. So if I open this up here in V carve, 
this is how I thought through the similar process and I made a template. Mm -hmm. So in my original model in Fusion, I just made that with all the different set parameters and I could go in and change the thickness of the extrusion or the material. And here as well, all I would do for the Fusion or VCarve template is I can open up a file from a template. It'll create a new file. I can change the thickness in the job setup. And I have all these notes here that I, you know, will look to as reference depending on whatever the particular thickness of the material is for that piece. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have a few formulas here, just quick math that really helped me figure out exactly the bowl depth depending on the material thickness. Mm -hmm. So let me just zoom in here. I drew some side view of this in VCarve. So this is if I were to look at the cross section of the plate, here's our mm -hmm. pocket. And this was with my original one inch thickness design. Yeah. Here's our little foot. And this is just for visual, right, Sammy? This is just so it can help you visualize what the toolpath is actually going to do. Right, exactly. So yeah. uh, I guess this is a good opportunity to just, before we get into too deep into this particular model, to think about how Fusion and VCarve are different in terms of how you might approach designing it. Mm -hmm. In Fusion, you don't have to think too much about the cam or the machining prior to making your design. In VCarve, it's kind of the opposite. You're making a 2D vector, but in order to create the 3D depth, we have to create a toolpath. We have to understand mm -hmm. what router bits we'll, we'll be using and how we use them to accomplish uh, or figure out, use the router bits to and the toolpaths to accomplish our goal, whether it's uh, the particular depth. And this is just the, the way I might draw out and visualize um, how to how deep I need it to go, what kind of router bit with what kind of radius I need to use, where mm -hmm. in Fusion I might model it and then just try to apply toolpaths to that form later on. Yeah, no, and I think what you're doing here uh, is is similar to what you would do in a notebook if you were using more traditional tools mm -hmm. where you would kind of draw out and do some math on some things. And I really like that you just do that right here in the VCarve Pro program. So uh, that information is stored with this file. So you are preparing this so you can come back to it in six or eight months and pick it back up and really understand exactly what vectors you have, uh, the tool paths that you've created, how they interact with each other and you know you could you could pick this up very quickly down the road right yeah so notes are very good to make for yourself later on you know things like grain direction is important to me that will affect mm -hmm. my tap placement you know knowing what router bits i've used I, that's good habits to get into is very clear labeling of your tool paths of your notes of your file name um, if you've if you've heard me talk about projects files before, you've definitely heard me talk about the uh, na naming conventions. Mm -hmm. So let's just zoom in on this for a second and look at the cross section. So we have, this is our material thickness from a cross section. And I wanted to make sure that we wouldn't have, we would have a lot of clearance between the bottom of this pocket and this corner here of the foot. So that distance here with the radius is uh, very generous. We have, this is going to be strong in terms of uh, how long it will last. If I remove that radius here, you can see that we're going to have a little bit of an issue uh, with that, the strength of the wall. Whereas if there's a radius, there's a lot more, I guess, meat there um, to hold it together. So- Yeah, there's a lot more fibers mm -hmm. interacting with each other and, and that's going to give us a lot more strength especially with the woods that you're talking about those those high density materials right and we won't because the uh we won't have as much of an issue with short and long grain uh as those walls depending on if we have the grain going this way uh we'll have long grain here on the sides but then it'll be uh, kind of short on on these sides so these walls would be not as strong the mm -hmm. added radius gives us a little bit more leeway there so here with my blue notes, I just made this for you so you could see, depending on the thickness of your material, the thinner the material, 
uh, the more we have to consider if we have this flat wall so the foot can sit in if we stack them. You can see here this radius that I had above on the one inch thick plate is too large and because the radius here won't allow uh, for the full foot to fit in. So if I remove that radius, I get this shape here. Mm -hmm. If I add a smaller fillet, then I can zoom in. You can see how those plates stack together. So just making a quick drawing like this will really help you figure out how those parts interact and how they uh, are working together as a set and as, a, as a, an assembly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and that's really, you know, doing CAD in 2D or 3D. And so Fusion, we have, you know, this additional functionality where we can draw on that three-dimensional space. But what you're showing here with VCarve is that, you know, it isn't just that white workpiece area of your VCarve file that you can use for CAD. You, you know, you have plenty of room there to do all sorts of other drawings that can help uh, affirm your dimensions on your material and the tool paths you're going to get to get that final good part. Right. And so this is another example of how you would in perhaps in VCarve, this is actually where I started with the project to kind of visualize mm -hmm. how they would nest together, which would be um, kind of similar. This is a much quicker way to get this idea through uh, than necessarily the way I, I did it in Fusion um, in regards to that. Uh, let's go ahead and break down our toolpaths here in this VCarve file. So I've made this a double-sided part. If we look at this in the 3D view here, we'll just go mm -hmm. ahead and preview these toolpaths just so you can kind of see. We'll preview all sides. So here I basically have the exact same model as our model here in Fusion. Right, these are pretty much the same. The way that we mm -hmm. accomplished it though, oh, I need my V-carve one. Different key commands, switching back and forth between programs, is that for the V-carve file, I have to use toolpaths in order to get my rendering versus mm -hmm. in Fusion, I make the model and then I have to figure out how to machine it. So when we're talking mm -hmm. about designing CAD with the CAM in mind, the workflow for VCarve, you know, really puts you on the other side closer, a little bit closer to machining quicker, uh, but you do have to use a little bit of your imagination, or if you are part, come from a, a strong work, woodworking background, you might have uh, already the experience to visualize the way certain router bits are going to work uh, give it, when you give them parameters. For example, make a pocket inside of this line. Mm -hmm. So if I go open up these toolpaths, I have my exterior profile pass. So that's just to cut this shape out. I would definitely run that as a second operation. Mm -hmm. oh, Got to get my mouse over here. There we go. And I also have a pocket toolpath where I have a clearing bit, the half inch as well as mm -hmm. the ball nose bit for the corner clear to give us that nice little radius. Yeah. And if we flip this over to the other side, I'll delete this scrap material. We can see this is the foot pocket. In order mm -hmm. to create that shape, I played with the concept of, is it quicker to run these edges on the table router? I can cut out the, the face of it and then just zip, mm -hmm. cut them on the uh, router table while the other one is cutting. The only issue with that is we have a radius here uh, that we need to accomplish in order for them to nest together because of mm. our radius on the top dish. Yeah. So. If you're going to do that, you might as well take advantage of the fact that you have to do a double sided part and, you know, put a little bit of a logo on the backside mm -hmm. and uh, do an, a little extra operation, but it'll make it um, something extra special there. So if we go look at the 2D view, let's look at our vectors. I'll open my layers panel so you can really see what my 
layers look like. Layer organization is also very key to a mm -hmm. lasting template. Here, I, I prefer my uh, the solid view here. So mm -hmm. the pocket, if we turn this off for a second, you can zoom in. You can see this ghost line, which is the exterior mm -hmm. profile, which is on the, a vector on the opposite side. I have this other line right here, which is the scoop of the bowl. And I wanted mm -hmm. my foot to be slightly smaller, so I offset it and then projected it to the bottom side and offset this again in order to create a space where we could pocket and <laughs> there we go and uh, clear out that that space for them to nest together. So it's a pr relatively simple tool path so in order to accomplish uh, this particular goal. Let's go ahead and see how we might change our tool paths based on different thicknesses of material. Let's see, mm -hmm. I have this is the version where we have the three little nesting uh, dishes within the nesting mm -hmm. honeycomb plate. Um, here we have to, if we'd like this piece to nest with our and our stacks, we have to do a pocket recess for a foot and then another pocket recess mm -hmm. foot for yes. the pieces that sit inside of it. So it's a very satisfying little uh, stacking part. Yeah, so this part is interesting because designing this in Fusion, I feel like you have a, a much more push-pull uh, visual of it where when you design it here in VCarve, we're going to see, you know, really you're you're creating it one toolpath at a time. Right. Uh, we have a question over here about uh, what finish do you use? Do you mean um, finish for the parts? I guess it really depends. You would like to use a food safe finish if you're going to eat off of it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll have to think about that. I use we use total boat finish for uh, other parts that are not, um, you know, more sign sign finishing. But I'll have to think about yeah, the food safe finish for for a couple minutes here. Um, okay. Right. So in regards to the push pull modeling in in fusion versus the router bit, the toolpath application in order to create those, create those push pull yeah. extrusions. Okay, awesome. So uh, let us know if you guys have any questions about Fusion or Aspire or VCarve. And if there's any kind of particular design to manufacturing process that you're interested in. Okay, so let me bring up an Aspire model here. Oh, that looks great. Yeah, I like to play with some geometric shapes. I also made one that was a just kind of more of a bowl shape. Oh, this is the other side. Yeah, so this one just has a, a, a normal concave. It's very subtle, subtle see. to see in the rendering here versus you know, a little bit more of a modern geometric shape. But you can see mm -hmm. here that I've accomplished something very similar to a model here I've made in Fusion. So here I have a geometric faceted one as well. And actually both of these did require 3D modeling. So in Aspire, I have linked in the description below a few videos on how to model a bowl or a dish in Aspire, uh, one mm -hmm. by Vectric and one by Mark Lindsay, who also makes amazing Vectric tutorials. So be sure to check those out as well. Uh, awesome. So this particular piece here, if we open our model, I wanted to make sure that this was sitting low enough, but that I could get a straight clearing bit here to make sure that mm -hmm. I had the recess for the foot as they're stacked, but also get to have a kind of a deeper 3D carving there as well. Yeah, and I really like this design because this with traditional tools would be an exceptionally hard part to make, right? When, when you look at the fixturing or jigs, you would have to do to make this part with traditional tools. 
uh, it would be really, really challenging. And, and being able to leverage digital, digital fabrication mm -hmm. and uh, uh, create a, a, a shape like this is just, you know, it, it really catches the eye and it kind of makes people want to reach out and, and touch it. And I think when we talk about uh, some of the, the great different design techniques, um, you know, both Aspire and, and, and Fusion can do this, but Aspire really does a, a great job at, at kind of creating very, very nice looking uh, designs, uh, especially as a single part. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, uh, I, I think the kind of goal here is that no matter what program you're using, you're able to accomplish very similar things. I think that uh, Vectric products and Fusion are very parallel products. I prefer using one over the other in different situations, the right tool for the right mm -hmm. job. Uh, and in this case, um, I really preferred using Fusion to kind of work through the, all of the design concepts, thinking about how I could use it, make this in different materials. Maybe I make a mold yeah. and do some slip casting or uh, ceramics. Uh, and model the masters or ma model the uh, machine the masters mm -hmm. or machine the molds. Uh, and then doing my cam in VCarve and Aspire just because that workflow is a little bit faster for me than it is in Fusion, especially when I'm doing double-sided flipped parts. Uh, so I think it's okay to use multiple CAD CAM programs um, and go back and forth depending on uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great explanation. You know, a lot of times we're presented with this question of which software should I use? Should I use VCarve or Fusion? And what you're showing here is is really, you know, it kind of depends on on what you're trying to accomplish, um, and sometimes both. Uh, and I and I think that's a that's a really good uh, really good thing to show here. Um, well, when you uh, were designing this in Fusion, Sammy, uh, I, I see you got a, a table design there. Uh, did you, um, was everything based off of the same sketch or did you, when you started a new bowl, how did you, did you start a new sketch? What was your kind of your design path there? Right, that's a good idea. Sometimes I do, or good question, I model my environment sometimes just so I can understand how it might look together, how it'll fit together, if it'll work as a larger concept. So I, I think that making models and renderings are a really great way of uh, cost-effective prototyping. So we can see how our parts might actually exist in an environment rather than, you know, investing a ton of time in machining and materials and then finding out maybe this didn't work quite as well as we, as we had hoped. Uh, so this allows me to kind of work through the concepts a little bit easier. From where I started, there's the way you draw in Fusion, the sketch, there are many sketches. So if I open this up, I modeled this table separately and then I imported separate designs. So if I open up my data panel here, you can see all of these different models that I have made in order mm -hmm. to uh, adjust each file for each unique work piece. So here is where I took my original design and to see how they stacked to work through the rendering aspect of it. And generally what I would do is let's just go ahead and, and um, we'll take, this is our original model. I'll go ahead and right click and copy this. Can you move your, uh, your own picture there? there? So yeah, perfect. Move it above the timeline maybe. Okay. So I have made a copy here. I'll rename this. And I'll open this file separately. So it looks the same uh, as the one over here. Uh, but now I'm going to change the parameters and walk through all of the, from the original model because say I have a half inch piece of material, but I also have a two inch piece of material. How might I change this model in order to accommodate the two inch piece of material? First, I might go to my parameters. I won't change the diameter of the plate because the set diameter of the hexagon is important to keep consistent so mm -hmm. that your hexagons all fit together, right? Yeah, they won't nest very well if they're different sizes, right? right? 
So I can just reference really quick my, my parameters here that I have set. So I'll just go ahead and leave those. But down here in the bottom left, I have my timeline. And this is kind of the story of how this model was created. So I can go ahead and double click on any event within that timeline and change any of the dimensions. So here, mm -hmm. the distance that that shape was extruded was the thickness of the material minus the foot thickness, because I wanted the overall mm -hmm. thickness to be the dimension of the material. So let's say this is the deep thickness, which is about two inches, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'll click OK. The next event in the timeline was when I extruded downwards the foot dimension. So now you can see the model is adapted, but my pocket is still the same depth. So I'll just go and mm -hmm. open up the event where I extruded the floor of the bowl, the dish. Mm -hmm. And here I can enter the dimension. So I can say minus deep thickness. Uh, and th this is where formulas can come in, or you can just set it to uh, a specific dimension. But if I want to have it go all the way through the thickness of the material, but I want to subtract the foot thickness and the floor or the thickness I want between the bottom, the top of the foot and the bottom of the bowl, I'll just say that's about, yeah. I don't know, about quarter inch. Then I know my, uh, I have plenty of space between this surface and this surface and we have a nice thick bottom that's going to last a long time. So I am, I, this could be a very uh, nice shape to have on your table. Maybe I want this to be a little bit more of a, a curved shape. So I have a radius here that's set. If I go into my timeline and click on the fillet, I can change this shape here to a big mm -hmm. round over. And this is definitely digital prototyping, right? What you're doing right here is what I, I call digital prototyping, where you're really kind of working through different design ideas and, uh, you know, general products um, in the digital space. Right, exactly. So this is how I might take one model and stretch it to accomplish quite a few things that, of parts that work together and mm -hmm. prototype how this fit together. Then after I have a good variety of options, I might set them together to see how they look and work together as objects in a collection rather than just independent standalone pieces. Okay, uh, awesome. Well, it seems like there's some folks uh, who maybe have done something similar. That's awesome. Please tell us more about that. Uh, if you've done a project like that before. Um, and I hope some of you try this and take the concept and make it your own. That's a really awesome thing about a project like this when you give yourself the parameters of here's the material I have available, here's kind of what I'd like to accomplish. And then you put on mm -hmm. your own la layer of uh, aesthetic choice and aesthetic um, preference. You're able mm -hmm. to take something like this and uh, it's a very simple concept, but to really make it your own. I also thought that the hexa hexagon nesting on the dining table would really fill that need for all of the CNC uh, folks out there to nest parts on our sheet goods really well. So you can uh, take pleasure in that at the diner din dinner table too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, Sammy, popping back over to your, your V-carve. Mm. So you, you had said that you... Uh, like to design, uh, you know, this kind of group uh, of, of products here in Fusion, and then you you were doing the toolpaths and V-carve. Mm -hmm. So you kind of touched base on the individual toolpaths. Um, how might you maybe go one more step and be like, okay, I also want to make some additional toolpaths for future scrap. So you can kind of have, uh, you know, this kind of way to deal with scrap is when you have it, you can kind of have different material thicknesses and, and foot uh, depths for, for uh, you know, in the bag, mm -hmm. I guess, is kind of what I'm thinking there. So how could you uh, take this quick model here and make maybe four or five different 
uh, V-carb toolpaths really quickly where to go into fusion and actually go through those four or five different individual models making CAM, I think is, is, uh, cost more time for you. So can you show why that you would do it in V-carb? Right. So V-carb here for making a variety of different thicknesses, I made many models in fusion and I made several files here in V-carb. Because I started with a template, it was very easy in order to change, open up and, and make a few adjustments similarly how, to how I did in Fusion as we walk through the steps in the timeline. If I want to open, let's go to File, Open, New from Template. I have a template here that I've made, which is exactly looks like this. We'll open this. I guess this is the, is that file. We'll save that. So here it'll open up the file that I originally created. So one inch is thick and, you know, a uh, sp specific job size. So if we have different material mm -hmm. to reach for, you can change these dimensions. In this mm -hmm. case, I decided to zero towards the center of the material because that was the, I'm using lots of live edge parts with no square corner to zero off of. So the center was going to be the way to go for this one. Mm -hmm. And I can just change the material thickness. So say I'd like this to be two inches thick. I'll say, mm -hmm. okay. And our material setup values will change. So it can, it will go ahead and recalculate my toolpaths, but I'll still have to go in and make a bunch of adjustments similar to how we did in the fusion model. So we'll say yes, mm -hmm. it's recalculated. So you can see here, you can also make some adjustments to see how, as we're talking in the side view, how our parts fit together if some are larger than others or taller than others. I can imagine how they might stack together if they're a taller model or if they're shorter, depending on the thickness of the material. So you can visualize in mm -hmm. different ways here. So now yeah. here's where all of my notes will come in handy. I would have different full pocket depth formulas here. So that would be the material thickness minus the foot thickness minus the bottom of the bowl thickness. Mm -hmm. So we'll open our tool paths here. And uh, for a deeper bowl like this, I have programmed it with a bowl bit. That's B-O-W-L, bowl bit. And that's a radius end mill. These uh, have uh, usually a larger diameter, like one inch or one and a half inches, um, and a radius corner, maybe a half inch radius or a quarter inch radius. So you Get that flat bottom on the pocket and also mm -hmm. a corner radius. You can also do a pocket with a half inch or a quarter inch uh, ball nose on the edge and then use a chip breaker or something for the clearing. I like the bull bit for something like this where it's only one bit is accomplishing both those tasks. Mm -hmm. So if I open my pocket bull bit, the cut depth is still set for if my material was one inches thick. So if I go to my two inches thick, I need to change this to 1.675. I'm going to still use the same router bit that I have programmed and I'll just calculate. So now you can see this goes to a more appropriate depth for this particular material thickness. Mm -hmm. Watch that run. And I like that you're working from the center out here. I think that's going to give you the best finish, uh, finish quality. Right. And the nice thing about the bull bits is that you don't have to perfectly line up the edge of the ball nose to the clearing bit there. Okay. So that is, and the other adjustment you'll have to make is for your exterior profile. Uh, I have mm -hmm. this set to Z. So this is kind of parametric here where when you type in Z to your cut depth for the profile to cut through all the way, Z will mm -hmm. reference the thickness in your material you set in the job setup. So once it recalculates, mm -hmm. when you open this file from the template, it should calculate and cut all the way through, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. So that's another handy, handy trick. Yeah, look at that, it goes all the way through. So that's how you might take a template and adjust it based on the different material thicknesses in this uh, 
adjustment case. So that might be how I would accommodate something similar. There are different toolpaths here you might use for a spire. In a spire here, I've used some, uh, I used a, actually this is the bottom side, let's flip to the other side. I used a 3D roughing and a finishing pass here for this pocket mm -hmm. uh, because we have a 3D model. If you have V-carve and not a spire, you can uh, still kind of accomplish something similar with the, with the bull bit or uh, there's kind of some ways to work around that as well. Um, Aspire, you have a little bit more ability to do things like dishes with the modeling uh, aspect of Aspire. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to read some of the questions here. Okay, well, it seems like we have some folks who are, who are using a variety of programs, Fusion and Vectric and yeah. Aspire. So um, I hope that this has been helpful for everyone to kind of consider how to approach design and uh, CAD for CAM and how we think about uh, prototyping, cutting different types of projects from different perspectives and different starting points. Mm -hmm. and, and really leveraging, you know, these different CAD CAM tools for their, their strengths that, that you can take advantage of. Um, if you're not uh, really comfortable in, in parametric modeling. Maybe you don't use the parametric features. Maybe you just do it one part at a time, but still being able to bring those parts together in that three-dimensional space and, and have them interact, you know, it is, is a really valuable thing. So whether it be SketchUp or Fusion or any other 3D modeling, um, understanding that, you know, use it for its strengths. And uh, yeah, I, I really like this concept. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining. I really appreciate uh, you indulging me on this project. It was super fun to do, and I hope you are able to take it and uh, make it to your own uh, aesthetics and to the particular program you have and the different material you have available. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next Friday. Yeah. See ya. Have a good one.